And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we are continuing our verse by verse Bible study through the book of 1 John. Last time we finished up in chapter 3 in verse 10. So we'll begin today reading in verse 11. I want you to remember that the key word here in this chapter is know, and it's all about knowing something. Remember, the true knowledge is the Bible knowledge, and John wants you to have the true knowledge of truth, first and foremost of salvation, but then also of who Jesus is and how we as Christians should live. So there's a lot of knowledge in this book of First John. Well, we also understand through reading this book and through studying history that there was a false knowledge out there, and there was a false group out there. And they were called the Gnostics. And they were going around and saying, well, I want you to believe this. I want you to believe that. Come with us. And they left the true church to start their false church. And we looked at that. And we saw how you've got to watch out for this fake knowledge and this fake truth and this fake church. Because they sure try to pretend to be Christian, but they're not. And the key word of no. So there are some key words that we find in this book. And here in chapter 3, without a doubt, the key word is knowledge. Knowing something, right? It's all about knowing. But also, there are some key words in the book of John. One of them is love. If you know the truth, you will show it by loving other people. That's basically what he's saying. And so as we go through, we saw many, many times the key words that were also if and we. We saw that in chapter 1 and 2. So now it's all about knowing and things like that and all about love. And it's all about the Christ. So his message is all about Jesus Christ. And I don't know why, but he uses the term Christ a lot. And I find that very interesting. Jesus Christ or the Christ. So we're going to see that, especially as we get into chapter 4, the message of who Jesus is. But here we are looking through this, and we're reading this, and we're seeing that, look, there's some things you need to know. You need to know. You need to know. Another key word in the book of uh, 1 John is believe. And there's some things that you need to believe, and I find that word a lot, believe. So he's telling us about what to believe and how to live. That sounds like Paul. Paul tells us what we're to believe in. According to Paul, we're supposed to trust the blood atonement of Christ because that's how we're saved. We're saved through the blood. And you say, well, where's the message of the blood here? Well, we saw it in chapter 1. So I've taught and I'll continue teaching that 1 John lines up with Paul. And so far we've seen many, 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 many places where 1 John lines up with Paul and he's pointing you to the blood. And Paul says it this way, faith in the blood. Faith in the blood of Jesus. Faith is believing and trust. So I want you to know that. I think it's important that we remember that. And so I've taught you that as we go through 1 John, we're going to see where he lines up with Paul. There's a group out there. I've talked about it before. I don't like talking too much about them, but... I want you to know and be aware and be careful. There's a group out there. They don't call themselves this. This is kind of the name that we've given them. But there are people out there called hyperdispensationalists, and they go overboard. They go to an extreme with Paul, and they say, only Paul and none of the other apostles. I, I don't see that as I read through Acts, if you remember our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through Acts, how Paul came to the early church, and they all got on the same page in chapter 15 of Acts, and even Peter said, well, I'm a grace believer. <laughs> Peter said, I believe that we should be saved by grace through faith, even as they. Acts 15, 11. So they all got on the same page if you believe your Bible. And if you believe your Bible, you can't be a hyperdispensationalist. Well, hyperdispensationalists say, don't read the book of 1 John because it's not for us today. Only Paul is for us today. Well, Paul is our apostle, Romans 11, 13. So his writings are the heart of New Testament doctrine for us today. But that doesn't mean we throw out Peter, John, and, you know, all these other books. No, the only one that we can't really apply forcefully is James, because James says it's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. I'm not one of the 12 tribes. But we've studied it verse by verse, and I showed you how we can spiritually apply a lot of the stuff in James to us. But basically, the majority of James is really a tribulational book. 
So we've looked at all this and uh, I've told you and I taught you right that there is a double application here. And as we get farther along in, in, in our uh, study here, we're going to see how there's a lot of things that line up with Paul that we can apply today. But also this book will be a tribulational book once the rapture takes place. The Jews are going to read this book and go, wow. And I believe that they're going to clearly see that, uh, wow, there's some things in here that do apply to us because we see the who message as we get into chapter 4. Actually, as we get into verse 23, we see the who message of this chapter, chapter 3. That looks like, verse 23 and 24, the who message in kind of a faith and works. So that, that would apply more out here because we know we're not saved by works. And over and over, as we've gone through verse by verse, we've seen where he says, no, we're saved by faith. And he says we should keep the commandments. But I don't see him saying you keep the commandments to be saved. We keep the commandments because we are saved. So there's a dual application of this book is what I'm trying to say. Now, let's go ahead and get started. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, last time we finished up in verse 10, so let's go in verse 11. Verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So love shows up a lot, and knowledge shows up a lot. If you know Jesus because you're saved, then you will love him, and you will love others, because you realize how much he loved us and to die for us. So he says there, that this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So verse 11 is again a message from the beginning. Turn back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. So here he is telling us now, the word from the... And then verse 8 says, again, a new commandment I write unto you. Is he saying, I'm not going to write a new commandment, but here's my new commandment? No, he's saying, if you want a new commandment, then here it is. It's the old commandment that Jesus said from the beginning. All right, I don't see a contradiction there. I see him going back to some of the things that Jesus said. So what did Jesus say? When did Jesus say this in the beginning? Well, in John's book. See, John wrote the Gospel of John. Then he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And then he wrote Revelation. So John wrote the book of John. And so we go back to John. And what John was doing was writing down the words of Jesus. And John's Gospel is very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John gives us a lot of quotes that Jesus said that we don't find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why is that? Well, I think it's because John is writing to the church. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, we can read those today, but they, they're really Jewish, kind of a Jewish message. Like they're trying to get Jews to believe that Jesus is the Christ, while the book of John is, hey, you need to realize Jesus is the Christ, but you also need to believe that through him is eternal life. So there's a lot to get into. Let's go to John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. And here is what the message is that he seems to be quoting over there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. So John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you. So there it is. There's the new commandment that Jesus is giving. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So isn't that funny? He says, love one another and also make sure you love one another. Why? Because sometimes it's hard. Let's be honest. Have you ever had a, a time in your life where it was very hard for you to love another Christian? <laughs> I have. Many times I bit my tongue. Mm, you know, a lot of times I just kind of zip my lip and say, Amen, brother, I love you. Because sometimes other Christians can be a real pain in the rear end. Right? They'll lie about you. They'll say things that aren't true. They, they hurt you. And they don't even realize it sometimes. And so I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to actually love one another. And so I try to do that. But why did Jesus say that we should love one another? Well, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So, John is saying love is key. But he's not just saying it because he's saying it. He's saying because that's what Jesus said. So, as we read through 1 John, we find a lot of times when he goes back to the words of Jesus. And he reminds us of some things that Jesus said. And he gives the commandment. Remember Jesus' commandment? Well, that's this commandment for you today too. So there's some things that Jesus taught in his earthly ministry that are for us today. And then there are some things that are not. And that's what rightly dividing is. Jesus had a ministry of three and a half years. And that's what we call Jesus' ministry. But he said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus' ministry was to the Jews in Israel. He said a lot of things in his earthly ministry. Some of those are reiterated by Paul or by John. Some of those are not. Jesus said, 
If your right hand offendy, pluck it out. If your right hand offendy, cut it off. Do you think that's for today? No, that was clearly a message for tribulation or a kingdom. That's the kingdom gospel that we've looked at before. So a lot of what Jesus is saying, for example, in the book of uh, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, that's what we call the constitution of the millennial kingdom. And Jesus is literally telling about the kingdom because Jesus came preaching the kingdom gospel. Remember? Well, the kingdom is when he's going to rule for a thousand years. That's the millennial kingdom. So a lot of what Jesus is preaching in his ministry is for out here. But John says, but a lot of stuff that he said can still apply and should today. And so John, in his book, writes some of the things that Jesus said that John was thinking, man, that's, that's still applicable for us. And one of those things that we should do as Christians certainly is love one another. Not just Jews loving Jews, but Christians loving Christians. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 12. Jesus is speaking, and he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, go down to verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. So, Jesus commanded us to love one another. Well, do we do it just because Jesus said so? Well, yeah, a lot of people say, yeah, because we follow Jesus. Jesus gave a lot more revelations to the other apostles. And guess what those revelations are? Some of them are in agreement with that. Some of them, God says, now it's a different time period, so now things are different. And uh, so the church age, there's some things that are different because it's kind of like the plan of God is on hold because the Jews rejected their Messiah. And we call that the postponement theory. And if you haven't seen it, see my uh, video on YouTube entitled The Postponement Theory. I hope I spelled it right here. So you know that, right? Uh, we've looked at it before that when Jesus came, he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was supposed to come as the king. But there was the tribulation that still had to take place according to Daniel's prophecy. And so Jesus shows up and somehow, I think, another three and a half years later, had they accepted their Messiah, then Jesus could have come right here. But because they rejected their Messiah, God says, okay, now this whole thing is future seven. So a future seven years out here, and uh, we'll postpone the kingdom and dealing with Israel. So that's what the church age is. It's an entire postponement. It's when God says, okay, Jews don't want me. I'm going to go to the Gentiles and get them saved. So a lot of the things that are doctrine for us today are from Paul and the early apostles. And it's interesting, as you read Paul and the early apostles, you find their commands. I have a series on YouTube entitled The Commandments of God, and I go through and give you the commandments of Paul, commandments of John, commandments of Peter, commandments of Jesus. And so some of the things in Jesus' ministry was only to juice, and it's very hard to try to force that into doctrine for today. But there are some things that Jesus did teach that are now taught as well because it was taught by the other apostles. Okay? Does that make sense? I hope so. I hope you get what I'm saying. So rightly dividing is learning what was Jesus' ministry and his teaching only for Jews, and what is the teaching for us today. And sometimes the things that Jesus taught line up with what's for today, and sometimes they don't. Let me give you an example. Peter came to Jesus, and Peter said, Lord, how often do I have to forgive? I'm so tired of these brethren. <laughs> how often do I have to forgive them? And Jesus said, until 70 times 7, so 490 times. Okay, so according to Jesus and his earthly ministry, again, only to Jews, he says you only forgive someone 490 times. So 490 times. I guess you can start counting. And when someone does you wrong, the 491st time you can go, ha, finally, I don't have to forgive you ever again. But that's not what we see in Paul. Paul, this, this different dispensation, Paul says we are to forgive others as Christ hath forgiven us. Did Jesus go to the cross and die for 490 of your sins and no more? And when you sin the 491st time, Jesus goes, okay, you're going to hell because I don't forgive more than, you know, 490 times. No. No, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ hath forgiven us all trespasses. So there are some differences between the ministry of Jesus and today, and between the doctrine back there and the doctrine today. And part of learning to rightly divide is to understand that, because today we're under the ministry of Paul. And I've said this before in some of my videos, and it's funny. 
I don't know where it is on YouTube, but somebody sent me the video where this computer voice says, Robert Breaker is wrong. He says we are under Paul's ministry today and not Jesus' ministry. And, and it's a funny woman's computer voice trying to, to make it sound. But Jesus' ministry was to the Jews. He said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul's ministry and the early apostles' ministry is for the church. And so the problem today is people read their Bible and they don't rightly divide. And all they want to do is go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they say, but I don't read the rest of the Bible. And they say, and I follow Jesus. Well, you're following the ministry of Jesus to Jews. Are you a Jew? No. So why don't you read the rest of the Bible? You say, well, because I don't believe in Paul. That's what they say. And you go, um, do you know what Paul said? He said, the revelations that were given to him were from Jesus Christ. So if you want to follow Jesus Christ, you must go to Paul and then where the other apostles line up with Paul, that is for certain for us today, and that is our New Testament doctrine. Do you realize the New Testament doesn't start until the death of a testator? It tells us in the book of Hebrews. So when Jesus died, that's what started the New Testament. A lot of people that claim to be Christians today, they don't go to the New Testament. They go back here to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you realize that even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the division of the Bible called the New Testament, what they're talking about in those books is still taking place in the Old Testament until Jesus literally dies in those books. So you're reading through the book of Matthew. Everything in the book of Matthew is Old Testament until chapter, is it chapter 27 where Jesus dies? And then's when the New Testament starts. So why are you going to the Old Testament to get your doctrine? That's the problem. Because Jesus is still dealing with Jews. If you want true New Testament doctrine, if you want to be an able minister of the New Testament, as Paul tells us, you have to understand Paul and the early apostles. And their commandments are for us today. So we take their commandments. And some of the commandments that they give are a little different than the teaching of Jesus' ministry. Some of them are the same. But I follow them because the apostles said so, because I know that Jesus revealed to them what is for us today. So you've got to understand and you've got to believe in dispensations. The word shows up at least four times in our King James Bible. But today we hear people run around saying, there's no such thing as dispensations, there's no such thing as dispensations, and you just want to laugh because you're like, no, it's in the Bible four times. <laughs> and uh, Hebrews starts out, with dispensations. God who in sundry times and in diverse manners did this, that, and the other thing. And so people, they don't rightly divide. And they get in a mess. They get in a mess. Well, did we read 15, uh, 12? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. So Jesus gives that command to these people, his disciples. But those disciples became his apostles. And so that was a command that came from here, but that it also goes over here. And we see that in Paul when we go to Romans 12.10. We see Paul reiterating, love one another, love one another. So we see that in the other apostles as well. Uh, Romans 12.10. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says this. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. 13.8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Galatians 5.13. Galatians chapter 5.13. That, that was a quote of Jesus. Huh, so interesting. So some of the things Jesus said, the early apostles repeated and said, this is a command from Jesus for today. It wasn't just in his earthly ministry. It's for today. But not everything Jesus said in his earthly ministry is for the church today. A lot of things Jesus was talking about were out here for the tribulation for the Jews and out here in the millennial kingdom. So that's what rightly dividing is. It's understanding, okay, what lines up with Paul and the early apostles and what is it that doesn't line up? Because what God gave to Paul and the early apostles is what's for us today. And uh, Galatians 5.13 says this. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Ephesians 4.2. Do you get the uh, thing here that I'm trying to give you? Love is something Jesus wanted in his earthly ministry, but he also wants the church to do. Love one another. 
And it says here in Ephesians 4, 2, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. And I just want to show you that, you know, I don't want to get too long into this and, and hammer this too much, but you've got to learn how to rightly divide. And when you rightly divide, you understand, wow, what's for us today, some of it is things that they went back and looked at Jesus and said, Jesus said this. And there's some things that Jesus said that was only to Jews, but then there are things that Jesus said that applies to the church today. And this is certainly one of them, that we love one another. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.12 And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. And then 4.9, 1 Thessalonians 4.9 But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Now let's go to Peter, 1 Peter 1.22. Are you getting a theme here? <laughs> the theme here is the church was founded with Jesus Christ by his death. And then slowly people began to believe in Jesus and became part of the body of Christ, but nobody knew what it was until Paul. And Paul said, you know what? It's the body of Christ. And all of us who are saved, whether Jew or Gentile, were part of the body of Christ. And Paul is saying, so love one another. So there were early Jews that got saved and into the body, and, and Gentiles. Well, you know what? Jews hated Gentiles. If you know the Old Testament, they were commanded to stay away from the heathen and not mix with them. So now they're saved in the same body. And there was a little bit of, I don't want to say racism, but I don't know what other word to use. Jews did not like the Gentiles. So now in the body of Christ, when they get saved, now they're supposed to love one another. And you read through uh, Galatians, you read through Acts, what happened? Well, whenever uh, Peter was there, um, some Gentiles come. Well, he withdrew himself, the Bible says, and was just with the Jews. So there was a little favoritism there. So the theme of this is whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're saved, you need to put aside any past hatred that you might have had, one for the other, and you're supposed to love one another. Now, 1 Peter 1.22 says this. 1 Peter 1.22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, I believe 3.8 is where I want to go. Chapter 3 and verse 8. And look what it says. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 4. John is the most lovey-dovey guy. <laughs> I like to call 1 John the book of lovey-doveyness. And that's why a lot of your Pentecostals and Charismatics, they, they love, love, love to talk about love, love, love. And uh, they love to go to 1 John because it's all love, 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 love. And it's just a little lovey-dovey. I mean, I, if you could go overboard on love, I kind of think John did because he talked about it a lot. But uh, let's go to 1 John. But there's a reason. There were people that were lost that came into the church, didn't get saved, looked at it and said, wow, we're going to take people out of here and get them into our cult. And they had hatred in their heart toward the true God, Jesus Christ. And they started a cult in which they said Jesus wasn't God. And those were the Gnostics. So the Gnostics didn't have love. So now you see why John is talking about love. Because he's like, if you really have love, if you're really saved, you will love the brethren. And you won't do that. You won't pull people out and try to start a cult. Okay, do you see that? So 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So there's these key words, love and know. Know, love. And uh, he talks about God a lot, but what is he doing? He's, he's actually, as we get into this book, a lot of this book is about Jesus being God. And he wants you to know that Jesus is God, something that the Gnostics did not teach. Gnostics don't believe that Jesus Christ was God. They believe he was some lesser little, I think they thought he was like some sort of a fallen angel or something. Uh, an aeon or something they called him. So 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, always with that word if and we, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. 2 John 1.5 2 John verse 5 says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Okay, so now let's go back to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 11, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So he wants us to love. Verse 9, he talks about being born of God. Being born of God is being saved, being born again. So when you're saved, Paul says, begotten by the gospel, when you're saved, there should be some love in you. Now, I'm not going to go to it now, but Galatians chapter 5 is the fruits of the Spirit. Guess what the very first fruit of the Spirit is? Love. So you prove that you're saved or not by whether or not you love the brethren and you're long-suffering and you can put up with them. So it makes me wonder. There's some people on YouTube that love to attack other Christians. I've got my, uh, what do you call them, detractors. I've got my people that hate me. And I've tried to watch their videos a couple times, and it's just like, no. no. I can't even go a couple of minutes in, and I just have to go, no. You can see the critical spirit. You can just see the hatred. You can just see the, the, the wicked, critical spirit of these people. And you don't see love. And so my first thought is, are they even saved? Because if you're saved, you're supposed to show your faith and your salvation by loving the brethren. And they're not doing that. So either they're saved and they're completely in the flesh and eaten up with a critical spirit and a dirty heart and bitterness, or they're just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. I mean, there's only those two. And so it makes you wonder. See, there's a lot of people out there, the Christians, that I might not agree with. But I love them, even if we don't agree on doctrine. If they're truly saved, I love them. And so that means I'll put up with them, and I won't go out of my way to be mean to them and make videos about them. I don't make videos of other people where I attack and name, call, and put down, because I read my Bible. My Bible says to love them and to be long-suffering and to, to have meekness and humility and not go after them, because then people would think something was wrong with me. What if I got in here and said, oh, I just want to make this video today. So-and-so said this about me. Why, that pug-nosed, cross-eyed, moron, full jack leg, rubber dubber I think he's just the biggest poopy head in the world. Why, that jerk, that moron. If I started talking like that, many of you would be like, man, Brother Breaker, where's the love? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so do you see how that doesn't show forth the love of Christ when you talk like that about people? If you are a Christian, you're to love the brother. And what does that mean? Well, the Bible says every one of us will give account of ourselves to God, so why would I waste my time dealing with so-and-so except to say, hey, I love you, and I think you should rethink what you're saying, and I think you're wrong in your doctrine, here's the videos, and I just want to encourage you and edify you and ask you to uh, rethink you know, your false doctrine. That's the way we should reach others in love, not calling them names and putting them down and attacking so I try to live Christianity, not just say with my mouth, I'm a Christian. John is telling us what shows that we're a Christian is how much we love the brethren. And like I said, it's hard sometimes to put up with and love other Christians. But we shouldn't lash out and attack and put down. So now we went from 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 to verse 12. Now remember the context, being born of God, verse 9. And not being of the devil. What does the devil do? He ridicules, he attacks, he mocks, he puts down. That's what a lost person does. Why would a Christian want to imitate that? That's not right. So we should love one another and not be as this guy. Now verse 12. Now we got a lot to get into here in verse 12. Verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So he's going through here and he's telling us to love one another, love one another, love one another. And then he says, but don't be like this guy. And he mentions a guy named Cain. Now hopefully you know Cain and Abel. The story of Cain and Abel. We're going to look at that real quick and talk more about that. But Cain was of that wicked one. He was wicked. He was evil. He was a murderer. Cain killed his brother. One time, and when I was a young Christian and I had just gotten saved, I was with another brother. And I will admit, I got in the flesh. And I was talking to this brother, and I said, man, brother, I hate this guy. I said, man, he lies about me, he does this. I said, man, brother, I hate that guy, man. Why does he do that? I, man, I, sometimes I wish he was just dead because he's just so evil. And my other brother in Christ, and I was in Bible school at the time, he looks at me and goes, brother, you got murder in your heart. <laughs> and I went, I felt like that high. I felt so bad. I said, what? 
He says, brother, if you hate that guy so much, you, you wish he was dead. He said, you got murder in your heart. He said, that ain't right. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right, brother. I'm sorry. I said, God bless the guy. Bless him real good. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't want to be that guy that hates on other people. And I don't want to be like Cain, that when I get angry, the first thought in my mind is, well, I'm just going to kill you. That, that's not the thought that should ever pop into the mind of any child of God. We should never want anyone dead. Okay? So he goes into here, and he goes into Cain. Now, what this does is this opens us up to a doctrine that I think is quite interesting. Some people teach this as a physical thing. I'm going to teach it to you as a spiritual thing. So there's two theories. It says Cain, who was of that wicked one. So the wicked one is Satan. Okay? Wicked one. That is Satan. And in some places, it's a capital. Like when you go over to Thessalonians, it's the capital W. That's the Antichrist. But it says, Cain, who is of that wicked one. So Cain was of the wicked one. Okay? And so Cain was of the wicked one. Some people come to this verse and literally teach that he was literally the seed of Satan. And they literally teach that, that Cain was the seed of Satan. Physically. Now let me explain this to you, okay? There's two theories on this. Theory number one is Cain is literally child of the devil. They teach that Satan had sex, we'll put mated, with Eve, and that produced Cain. Have you ever heard that before? That Satan literally came to Eve and raped her, or maybe seduced her, so maybe it wasn't rape, maybe she was willing. And they teach, and that boy, Cain, was literally a son of Satan. And that is their teaching, and so they say it's a physical seed. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> One of your famous old guys, uh, Brahman, or Brahman, Kenneth Brahman, Brandon, Brandon, I forget the guy's name. He started a cult many years ago. A lot of people think he's some sort of prophet, and he taught this. He taught that Cain was literally the seed of Satan, in the sense that he was the son of Satan. <laughs> wow. The other theory is that this thing is spiritually. And that Cain is spiritually of the devil. But he's really the child of Adam. And uh, so he's Adam's son, but he gave himself over to Satan. And so now he is spiritually of the seed of Satan because he spiritually fell into wickedness and did evil. So let's go and let's look at these two theories. Now... I don't know what to say about this. Sometimes I, I look at this and I see other Christians say they believe that literally the seed of Satan is Cain. And so that Satan literally had sex with Eve and produced Cain. And I just kind of go, but this is why they say it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse um, 13 to 16. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. The serpent beguiled me. Huh. She was beguiled. Uh, what? Satan beguiled me, and I did eat. And they say, so what Satan did was Satan laid with her and got her pregnant. And I'm like, um, that's pretty far-fetched, but let's keep going. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Now look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And so they say, see, see, so Satan's seed is Cain, and, and so the devil literally seduced Eve and had a baby with her. Well, that's what it makes it sound like as you're reading it. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So a lot of people say, so this is what took place. Literally, Satan had sex with Eve and produced Cain. Well, yeah, as you read through there, I can see where it comes from, that teaching, and why they teach that. Now let's look at chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. 
and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Um, okay, doesn't that prove that Adam was the father? Because when Adam conceived, that's had relations with his wife, then she had a baby. That makes it sound like... To me. So you see, there's two sides. And some people argue one side, but they don't read the rest of the verses. And this looks like, no, no, the father of, of this guy was really... Adam. And here's an interesting thought, too. Um, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. Notice it doesn't say, and again she conceived. So, I was taught in Bible school that Cain and Abel were twins. And it looks like that as you read through here. Otherwise, it would have say, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare his brother Abel. It doesn't say that. It says, they conceived and then they had Cain, and then Abel. So I think that it could be possible that these two are twins. Cain and Abel were twins. And maybe not. I mean, sometimes you read the Bible, sometimes you read into it. And you got to be careful. You don't want to read too much into it, but you also don't want to miss what it's actually saying. So Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Well, some people say, well, she was wrong. She got a man from the devil. And then the conception of Adam... That conception is what brought forth Abel. So you have all these theories. One of the theories is Cain is literally the seed of Satan. And Eve was pregnant. Adam didn't know. Adam went into his wife and she had twins. And the first one that was popped out was the seed of Lucifer, Satan. And the other one that popped out was Adam's son. <laughs> and I just look at that and I go, Really? Okay, so their theory is that Cain is Satan's seed, so child of the devil, and the other one is Cain is spiritually of the devil. So one is a physical, one is spiritual. That Cain is of the devil, and that Abel is of Adam. That's the theory that they give. Now, who is Satan? According to the Bible, Satan was the anointed cherub that covereth. That's over there in Ezekiel 28, 14. And Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 15, talks about how Lucifer, or Satan, fell from heaven. How have thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The devil's name, before he fell, was Lucifer. Then he became the devil, or the adversary, or Satan. So the actual name of Satan is Lucifer, we're told in the Bible, and he is a fallen angel. There are different classes of angels. There's cherubim, seraphims, angels, and all this stuff. And so people say, well, if he's just a fallen angel like the other fallen angels, over there in Genesis 6, look what the fallen angels did. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, in the Bible, we have fallen angels. Okay? Fallen angels. And the fallen angels, they mated with human women and they produced giants now some Christians believe this I personally do because the Bible teaches it but some Christians say oh, I don't believe that okay and you ask them are there any giants in the Bible they go no there are no giants that didn't happen no fallen angels can't have sex with women well what if they drank blood you know what if an angel drank blood? Well, then the life of the flesh is in the blood. Maybe they were able somehow through drinking of blood to take on a uh, fleshly body and be able to do that. I don't know. Or maybe it was all kind of like a laboratory thing. Maybe they got together in a laboratory and they mixed angel DNA with human DNA. I don't know. But the Bible says it produced giants. And a lot of Christians go, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. There are no giants. I go, oh, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, every Sunday school kid that learns about um, Goliath as a giant, he wasn't really a giant. Oh, well, no, jo Goliath was a giant, but there's no... Uh, mm -hmm. Let's just look at the Bible. Let's look at the Bible and look about some giants. Genesis 6-4, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. Well, we know the flood of Noah destroyed a lot of those. But then it says, and also after that. 
So after Noah's flood, there were some more giants. That shows me that some other angels must have fallen. And look at what it says about these giants. Let's go to Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33. Numbers 13, 33. I just believe the Bible. And if it tells me that somehow angels had sex with women and produced giants, then I believe that. And I believe the Bible tells us what those offspring of that looked like. And the Bible says they were really, really, really big. A very tall stature. Numbers 13, 33, the Bible says this, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which is kind of interesting. Anak, Anakim, Anakim, Anakin, Anakin Skywalker. All that, you know, all these Hollywood movies, they all somehow sound like something diabolical that was in the Bible. <laughs> Anak, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Okay, a grasshopper to me is about that big. Well, maybe it's a big grasshopper, but still, I'm, wow, that sounds like it must have been big if you're looking up at it and going, oh, I feel like a grasshopper because that giant's so big. Wouldn't you agree? Deuteronomy chapter 2. So in the Bible, there are giants, and the Bible describes them of who they are. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 11, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. Verse 20, and also accounted the land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamumims. And they are a people tall as the Anakims. Verse 21. And uh, they also have other names, the Avims, the Hazarim, the Kaphtorims, and things like that. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 13. Deuteronomy 3, 13. And the rest of Gilead and all Bishon, being the kingdom of Og, gave it unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. Matter of fact, there was a giant whose name was Og during the time of the writing of this book when Israel was going there into the land. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants, verse 11. And uh, there was giants after that because David fought a giant named what? Well, if you know your Bible, you know his name was Goliath. Joshua chapter 12. So there are giants in the Bible. Some of these people that claim to be Christians that don't believe in giants say, well, oh, they were just men of renown. They were just, the, a giant in the Bible is just a guy who has a lot of fame. No, the Bible says tall people and that we are like grasshoppers in their sight. So get, get on board with the Bible, okay? Joshua 12, 4, look what it says. Joshua chapter 12, verse 4. And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edri. Ashtaroth, that's where we get Ashtaroth from. Aster, Astarte, uh, Easter comes from that. Interesting, it all ties back to those evil. The term Easter is a pagan term for, for false god, by the way. Joshua 13, 12. Joshua chapter 13 and verse 12. All the kingdoms of Og in Bashan, which reigned in Ashtoreth and at Edredi, who remained of the remnant of the giants. So giants are mentioned in the Bible. Now watch this. If you were a giant, think about this for a second. Let's go to 2 Samuel. If you were a giant and your daddy was an angel and your mama was a human being, what would you be like? When Jesus came, it says he came as a man a little under the angels. So angels are above men. So what is an angel? I don't have time to get into it, but an angel is a spirit. And what is a human being? Well, a human consists of three, body, soul, and and spirit. An angel is just a spirit, but somehow it was able to take a body. So if you had the offspring of something like this, what would you get? You would get something that was spiritual, so it would have had a spirit, and it would have had a body, but it probably wouldn't have a human soul. So you would have a creature that was a spiritual being with a natural body, a spirit being with a body, and it was a giant. So we knew that it wasn't natural from humans. It was a giant. It was tall statue. Matter of fact, the Bible tells you how many f feet tall it was. But look at the distinguishing characteristic of one of these giants. One of these offsprings of angels and men. Look at what they are. 2 Samuel 21, 20. 2 Samuel 21, 20. Look what it says. Now, now, first of all, we have the brother of Goliath, verse 19. Verse 18, we have the sons of the giants. They're giving the names of some of these giants. And 
Ishbibenob, verse 16, which was the sons of the giant. It tells you how much his spear weighed and things like that. But look at verse 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath. And Gath, by the way, is where Goliath is from. Where there was a man of very great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. Verse 22, these four were born to the giant in Gath. So that's interesting. So these spiritual uh, beings with a natural body, they could have children too, the sons of the giants. But one thing that distinguished them as being from this seed was they had six fingers and six toes. So the Bible is clear. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 20 also. But the Bible is very clear that it is possible, and don't ask me how, but it is possible that an angel could fall from heaven and come down and somehow have relations with a woman and produce a giant. But that creature that is produced is going to have six fingers and six toes. And it's not going to look human because it's going to be giant in stature. 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 6 again. And yet, again, there was war at Gath, and there was a man of great stature whose fingers and toes were four and twenty-six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was the son of the giant. So this is what something looks like that is the product of an angel with a woman. All right, now, a lot of people say the devil was the first to fall, and the devil, he did that with Eve. And so they say that Cain was... Literally the child of Satan. Well, if we read the rest of the Bible then, wouldn't Cain have been a giant? Wouldn't Cain have had six fingers and six toes? And so we go back here to verse 12 of 1 John chapter 3. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. They say, so Cain was the seed of Satan. All right, I have a question. Did Cain have six fingers and six toes? Was Cain a giant? If he was, do you, don't you think it would have mentioned that in Genesis? And Cain was born, and he came out with six fingers and six toes. And he said, oh, what is this? And he was a giant, and he grew to be, you know, 20 feet tall. Um, I think we would have read that in Genesis if that's what happened. So it's kind of far-fetched for me to believe that when we're reading here that Cain was of that wicked one, that literally Satan had sex with Eve, and that Cain came out as a giant. Because that's what would have had to have happened if he was of the seed of the devil, then Cain would have had to have been a giant with six fingers and six toes. But we don't see that in the Bible. So I don't think that, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me that literally the devil had sex with Eve and produced Cain. I don't see that. I think what it is is that Cain is of that wicked one spiritually, and that he is a spiritual seed of the devil. Because if he was a physical seed, the Bible would have told us that Cain was a giant with six fingers and six toes. Okay? Now, a lot of people, they'll, they'll go to this doctor and they'll say, no, 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 you have to believe Cain was literally the seed of Satan, and that he was literally Satan's son. But I don't, it's hard for me to, to accept that, otherwise he would have had to been a giant. But uh, this brings us to the question also of, of what is a demon? Where do demons come from? I have a video on YouTube entitled, Where Do Demons Come From? If you get a chance, watch that. But if an angel comes together with a human woman and they produce a giant, that giant is a spirit and it has a body. But when that body dies, what happens? That spirit is wandering around without a body on the earth. And so that spirit is what the Bible calls an unclean spirit. So I believe that the demons or the devils or the unclean spirits in the Bible are the disembodied spirits of the giants. That's my thought. That's my belief. And I always thought that reading the Bible. And then one day somebody said, hey, read the book of Enoch. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I believe that book. And, and I don't. I read it and I found probably four or five places in it where I just laughed. And I said, no, somebody changed it. But it is mentioned in the book of Jude, as it is written in you know, the book of Enoch and things like this. And over there in Jude, let me make sure I find that for you, because I don't want to just say that and not show you where it is. Amen. Over there in Jude, he says, and he's quoting from the book of Enoch, and he says here in Jude, 
Verse 14, And Enoch also the seven from Adam, Adam prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon, and all this. So this is supposed to be a prophecy from Enoch, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe that that prophecy is found in what they call the book of Enoch. But what we have today called the book of Enoch, it's got problems. There's some things in it that are just laughable which shows me that it's been corrupted and been messed with. And like I said, I found about four or five places in it that just look so utterly Catholic that in my mind, some Catholic scholar went through there and just started changing stuff to try to add doctrine in that, that, that's not biblical. It just, But the book of Enoch says that demons are the disembodied spirits of the giants. And so I was like, wow, I already believe that. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us where demons come from. That's, I find that interesting. And, but if you go in the Bible... It talks about what demons are, and they're unclean spirits that are walking around looking for bodies. Uh, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, talks about that, how the unclean spirits are looking for a body to inhabit. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 9, we see a, uh, a man, actually in another uh, gospel, it's two of them, but there's a man there who's demon-possessed, and he has a thousand unclean spirits in him. So what are unclean spirits? They would be a spirit being that at one time had a body. And that body was giant. It was a giant, huge body. And what happened? Well, their body died, and now they're just a spirit wandering around. And somehow they can get inside and inhabit people. Okay, now, let's go back to Jude real quick. Chapter 1, verse 11. We're talking about Cain. Jude 11. Look what it says here. In Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the game, saying of Cory. So we see that there was a way of Cain. The way of Cain. Well, what is the way of Cain? The way of Cain is killing, because he was a murderer. Anybody who doesn't agree with you. And Cain did that. Now, with that stated, let's go look at John 8.44. John chapter 8, verse 44, the Gospel of John, John 8, 44. So I personally don't adhere to this teaching that Cain was literally the child of the devil, that Satan had sex with Eve and produced Cain. I, I find that a little far-fetched, because if that happened, then Cain would have been a giant with six fingers, six toes, and I don't see the Bible ever mentioning that. So when I see in 1 John that he says Cain was of that wicked one, I look at that as spiritually... And this passage over here in John 8, 44, that shows that to me. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil. Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees, these lost religious people. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Wait a minute. The devil wasn't a murderer. How did the devil murder anybody? He didn't. The first person in the Bible to murder someone was Cain. So the only way that the devil could be a murderer from the beginning is if the devil must have gone inside of Cain. And then when Cain murdered his brother, the devil was doing it. So the first demonically possessed person in the Bible, I guess, would be Cain. And so Cain is spiritually of the seed of the devil. Because the devil was influencing and even possibly even using him to murder Abel. Abel, of course, is a type of Christ, an innocent who died. But he says, you, over the father, the devil, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's the father of lies. Well, what was the first lie in the Bible? Well, Satan lying to Eve, but then Cain lying to his daddy and said, I don't know where my brother is. <laughs> lie. You, you knew right where he was, because you beat him to death and left him out there behind a rock. You know what I'm saying? So I see spiritually as, as the seed of Satan. Now, what is the story of Cain and Abel? We don't have time to go there. Read Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 16, and you see the story of Cain and the story of Abel. And it's a story of sacrifice. When Adam and Eve sinned, God said, All right, the only thing that, that I will accept for sin is blood. And the Bible says that God clothed Adam and Eve in the uh, skins of animals. So he must have sacrificed those animals. He must have shown Adam and Eve, okay, when you sin, you bring a lamb and sacrifice that lamb for your sin. And God did that in front of them. And I'm sure that probably disgusted them. They probably went, oh, oh, look at the blood. Oh, the poor animal died. And God goes, yeah, in your place for your sin. And so whenever they sinned, I'm sure, because all throughout the Bible, when a, a man sinned, he brought to God a 
blood sacrifice for his sin. And so we see in Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel coming to God one day and bringing a sacrifice for their sins. And God accepted Abel because Abel said, Lord, I have nothing to offer except this lamb. There's three things in the Bible that God demands. God demands holiness. He demands that you live without sin. Well, we all messed that one up. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He demands blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. God demands blood for sin. And then God demands faith. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. So what should our faith be in? In the blood. And so that's what Abel did. He brought this blood sacrifice and he offered it up for God. He says, Lord, I, I'm just trusting in this, that you'll accept this in my place for my sins. And God said, I accept you, Abel, because Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. Well, old Cain comes, and Cain knows that God can't forgive you without blood, but Cain says, Lord, I, I guess what? I'm a gardener. You know, Cain was the gardener, and, sh and uh, Abel was the shepherd. And he came to God, and he said, here's a bunch of watermelons, here's some turnips, here's some tomatoes. Lord, guess what? I, I grew a couple cantaloupe, and Lord, and, and, and look at this, Lord, some really good uh, rutabaga, and Lord, would you, would you accept all this fruit that I did? And God says, no. I told you, bring a blood sacrifice. I will not forgive without blood. And Cain says, well, I don't think that's very nice. Well, I think you're a mean God. Why? That's horrible that you, would, you wouldn't you would accept what I brought you. I, I sweat of my brow. I was out there working and making all this stuff. And how? who do you think you are, God? Why won't you accept my tomatoes? And why? Uh, cucumbers. And Lord, you know, you should accept my radishes. And God says, that's your own fruit. That's your own works, Cain. I'm not going to accept your works. And so what we see in Cain and Abel is a great example of the difference of salvation by faith and salvation by works. And there was no salvation by works because God said, no, Cain, I won't accept that. You must bring blood for your sins. And so the Bible says that Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's wasn't. And Cain got so mad, he went over there and killed his brother, Abel. So isn't that awful? So go back to 1 John chapter 3, and that's the story, and that, that points us to the blood of Jesus. Today, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us. And you can't be saved by your works. And yet a lot of people are just like Cain in the world today. They think, well, if I just do good enough works, and if I offer God this that I did, then God will accept me. No. First book of the Bible, we see a great illustration of how God doesn't accept our fruit, our works. And we can't come to him and say, accept me based upon what I did. No, we have to come the way God says through a blood atonement. So 1 John chapter 4, remember verse 11 is about love. Verse 12 is what happens when you don't have love, while well, you go out and do evil things and you kill people. Well, then you're of the wicked one. Then you're spiritually doing Satan's work instead of God's. And then verse 13 says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. <laughs> There's if again. But he says, Marvel not if the world hates you. The world has the spirit of Satan, and so the world hates. The world hates. Have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Marvel not if the world hates you. The context is how Cain hate, hated Abel. How much Cain hated Abel. And so he's literally, he's, he's hinting there, he's saying there, so don't marvel if the world will kill you like it killed Abel. And when he's writing this book, there was persecution against Christians. And the Roman Empire said, we hate these Christians because they're everywhere now. And they're running around and they're saying there's only one God. And that's Jesus Christ. Because the Romans said, we believe in any God. As long as you just worship uh, Caesar as God, then we'll, we'll get along. We won't have any problems. And the Christian says, no, Caesar, you're not God. And so Caesar says, well, then you're going to die. And Caesar probably of the spiritual seed of Satan, was going around killing Christians because the Christians were saying, we won't bow the knee to you, Caesar, because you're not our God. And so there was massive persecution. The Fox's Book of Martyrs is an interesting book. Early Christians were slaughtered by Rome, killed for their faith in Christ. They were cast into the Colosseum to be killed by the lions or by the gladiators. And there was much persecution of Christians. Matter of fact, John was out here on the island of Patmos, Fox's Book of Martyrs teaches in the book that around 100 A.D. they tried to come to John the Apostle. 
And by that time, they had killed most of the apostles. They, they killed them all. They, they killed Peter, supposedly uh, crucifying him upside down. They, the, Paul was, was beheaded. They killed all the early Christian leaders except John. And they said, John, we're going to boil you alive. And they put him in a pot. And, and, and the pot was boiling. And he just stood there looking around going, well, I'm still alive. <laughs> And it uh, reminds me of the Hebrew children back in the Old Testament. You know, they put them in the fire and they didn't die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But anyway, uh, so you have John living. And so they exiled John to the island of Patmos. And I'm not sure if he wrote this book there on the island of Patmos. It could be. But he did write the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. And that says that in the book of Revelation from the island of Patmos. So he was literally in a concentration camp writing these books in a time, historically, where they were murdering Christians, killing them. And so that is kind of why you read this and, and understand that and realize, wow, okay, so he's saying the murderers are not of God. So quickly, let's finish up here, just a couple more verses. Verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Okay? We will continue next time, probably starting in verse 14. So we got from verse 11 to verse 13 here. But let me just close with this. There were people coming into the church, and if you know your history, in Rome, they had what they called the catacombs. And because Rome was persecuting the early church, most Christians had to go down underground and meet underground in an underground catacomb, which was basically where they buried dead bodies, and hide and have church service in secret. And they would go out during the week and they'd witness here, witness there, they tried to share their faith, but then someone would spy on them and then go and tell the Romans and say, that guy's a Christian. And there were many instances in history of where they're meeting, hiding in the catacombs, and in comes a lost person that pretends to be a Christian, then runs out and gets the Romans, the Romans come in and kill the Christians. And so as we're reading this book, we have to remember what was happening historically during this time. And who was it that was turning in the Christians? A lot of them were the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were looking at Christianity and saying, you know, there's some stuff there that we can apply to our teachings over here. And slowly, because Christianity grew so much that they couldn't kill them all, Rome finally just gave up and said, all right, we're all Christians now. And in 325 AD, the Emperor Constantine said, you know what, I'm a Christian. And he had the Council of, of Nicaea and all these things. And eventually, then you had the Roman Catholic Church, the Gnostic roots of the Roman Catholic Church we've already looked at. And we see, if you can't beat them, join them type of mentality. Well, we can't destroy Christianity, so let's just make our own Christianity. And that's what they did. But true Christians love each other and are willing to die for Jesus. And false Christians are those that uh, just want to kill those they don't agree with. And I'll close with this, but if you know the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and you know the history of the church, there's the true church, and then in 325 AD there's the false church. And the false church set up what they call the Inquisition. And the false church, the Roman Catholic Church, had what they called the Santa Inquisition, the Holy Inquisition, in which they would take people and persecute them and torture them and bring them before trial, before Catholic priests, and then literally kill them at an auto de fe, they called it. And they would take a person and they would burn them at the stake and they would kill anybody who said, no, I'm a true Christian and I don't believe in your false teaching. They said, kill them. You're against Holy Mother Church and we kill you. Is that what the Bible teaches a Christian to do? Not on your life. Nowhere in the writings of Paul, nowhere in the writings of John and the other apostles does it say, if anyone claims to be a Christian but they don't teach the right doctrine, then they're heretics and we go kill them. It does not say that. It does not say that. But yet that Roman Catholic Church did that. And they're going straight back to their great-great-great-granddaddy, Cain. And they're proving that they are of him, who spiritually was of that wicked one. So any so-called Christian denomination that practices murder is not a Christian denomination. It is not of God. It is of Satan. Okay? And I just wanted to share that. I went a little long today. We have so much more to get into. 
But I, I, there's so much to get into. I, I wanted to talk about that. If you truly love the brethren, you wouldn't go kill them. You wouldn't start a big, huge religious organization that believed it's okay to kill people. You wouldn't do that. That proves that you're not of God by the fact that you're killing people. All right, next time we'll get into this and uh, look at some more. Thank you for watching. God bless. Bye-bye.